Okay, well, how many of you aren't photographers? Hold up your hand. That might be easier. I don't believe you. I don't believe you at all. You know? Everybody today is a photographer. It's how we speak about our world. If you're not a professional, that's fine. It's, it's, it's part and parcel of how we speak about our world and it's in language uh, now. And, uh, and, it's, and it's important that we realize that. Out in the little town where I live, in the middle of Kansas, my wife and I have a gallery. And every once in a while, people come through there and they go walking down the, down the wall. And they start seeing all these, uh, these pictures of, of Egypt and the pyramids, and then there's Machu Picchu down in Peru, and then there's Easter Island and all this kind of stuff. And I can kind of see them going, going starry-eyed, you know, a little bit, you know? And, and, they, and, and I can see the question coming. I've seen it before, and I can see the question. It's going to be one of two questions, okay? The first one is easy to answer. The other is what this whole presentation is about today. The first one is, when I go over and talk to them, do you actually go to the places you photograph? <laughs> Honest to God, that is the question. And I go, yes, that's the way it works. That is the way we do it. We actually go there, you know. The second question is more difficult. Because what they say is, what's your favorite thing to photograph? Or more fundamentally, what kind of photographer are you? They mean, do you do sports, nature, weddings, um, wildlife, uh, what, culture? You know, what, what kind of photographer are you? And I often puzzle about that because I do all those things depending on the story that I'm doing. And so what I really want to tell them is, I'm a story photographer. I do what is necessary to tell the story. And particularly, I like unsung stories. I like stories that no one else would pay attention to very much if I didn't. And, and particularly because I'm not the greatest photographer in the world. I'm going to confess that right now. That isn't me being humble. It's just me being realistic about what I can do. And the stories are the leverage by which I take the photography and hopefully do something that in some remote way might move somebody, let alone move the world, but provide that fulcrum point to help leverage the pictures into action and impact. And so I want to start out uh, our presentation uh, today with a little example of how pictures work, how pictures tell stories, and how they transmit from one place to another. So we're going to start here, in Edinburgh, Scotland, during the Edinburgh Fringe, with these lovely folks who were doing National No Smiling Day. And I followed them around for quite some time, and you know, I like the guy's line, it's not funny. And it's the National League of Pessimists, who's promoting uh, all this, you know. They were hilarious. They were just absolutely hilarious. So we brought that picture back home to our little town in the middle of Kansas, and after a while we thought, hey, this would be kind of fun. Let's do it here. So we did. And uh, we got all dressed up in our black suits and all that sort of stuff. You can see me. I'm the third one over from the, from the right there. There's Rita Sharp and Jan and, uh, and Callie and Dwayne and everybody. We went walking up and down the street. Now, the reaction in, in Lindsborg, Kansas was rather different than it was in Edinburgh, Scotland. You know, people driving by, you could see the whites of their knuckles. You know, and they, and they would not look at you over the pro protesters over here at the side. And in fact, they called the cops on us. And here is the emergency law, you know. Lindsburg at 12.24 p.m. Saturday, Lindsburg police received a complaint <laughs> demonstrating a sign. It's a dangerous thing, demonstrating a sign. Demonstrating a sign. The subjects were advised, or the subjects advised officers. It was national non-smiling day, you didn't get that right. And the subjects were advised of the complaint. But you see what happened there? Somebody did something. We, I did a picture of it. We got the idea from the picture. That little nugget was transmitted. And then, and then this nice other thing happened. The story grew. You know, the place was called. It was different where we did it. You can never repeat anything exactly. But it became part of 
their, what there was in their culture became a part of our culture and a part of our story of our life as well. That's very often how pictures work. And if you, if you think that pictures can go out and change the world in one fell swoop, probably not. If you think that pictures can do little things like this in great mass movements, then they can. And that is where I like to put my effort into images and stories. Because I say the, the images together with the stories are the real leverage points, and those are the determining factors for me of what kind of what kind of pictures do I do I need. So I love those kind of things, you know. I'll tell you what, as a photographer, yeah, if I can be out there with uh, naked women uh, in red body paint at Beltane Fire Festival in Edinburgh, you know, I know some picture's going to come out of that, and it may not be tell you a lot, but what it tells you is going to tell you real strongly, you know. Or out there with those ranchers in the far sand hills of Nebraska when the big storm is coming in, or out there at wheat harvest in Kansas looking down on them as they get down to the middle of the field. And I can tell you a bit, I can add something, being a farm boy, I can add something to this story. You see the guy on top? He chickened out. You see that? You see, he kind of went a foot or two off to the side, you know? He chickened out. You know he's buying beer that night because he chickened out. All those things came out of my youth and were remembered as I was doing pictures all over the world. For instance, I remember going to market on Saturday. I was absolutely entranced by this house there on the north coast of Brittany because what it tells you is that little bit of mystery. Who the hell thought of putting a house between the rocks? <laughs> and it will linger there forever, and I never want to know the answer to that. I want it to go on just like that. In the same way that you wonder, who the hell were the people putting up the statues there? The Moai on Easter Island? Or how did Fingal's Cave come up with that name? What happened when Mendelssohn went there and wrote his overture and the Victorians came and swamped the place and it really changed our view of the, uh, the natural world? Or simply to be there, you know, trying to absorb with the birds coming out from Boray on, on St. Kilda, you know, what this place means to them. Those are the simple kinds of things. What, what the change in climate means to that polar bear out there on the ice. So those are single picture kind of storytelling. What I really have gravitated to in my career, my life, is multiple pictures in, in places like this. I thought when I was going to Cuba, Kansas, a town of 300 at the time, some 35 years ago, that I was going to photograph a town dying. And certainly, you know, this image you see of Barry Krasny coming there in their back door there, you know, would be that kind of image of a place that, that's seen better days. But you know, Mary had a wonderful sense of humor. When she saw that picture, she said, you know, isn't that wonderful? She said, it makes me look like the devil. <laughs> well, that turned out that that place was full of life, and it didn't die very soon. It, it went on and on and on. So there was Betty Clawman out there with her geese, and the people pull at the uh, at the harvest festival in the summer, uh, the beer race, you know, ride your horse down the end of the arena, drink a quarter of beer, uh, ride back. Nobody said the horse couldn't help. You know, I, I kind of like going back and forth between those pictures. You know? <laughs> I gotta love a place that has nighttime blindfolded riding on the horses. You know, <laughs> these people didn't know how to die. They had no intention of dying. You know, I had to adjust. My, my storytelling, my pictures, the whole thing, to fit into that. There were, of course, the very poignant moments. And what it really taught me in this place was that there were incredible things. There were incredible moments, even in a place which is now 200 people. So there would be Doc McClaskey there with Barbara Crow when she came in. Or the prom, in the, in the junior senior prom in the town hall. Or Connie and Einar Stowe at their wedding dance up in the up in the hall. All of these things going on and on. The last meeting of the Czech club. And they pull the curtain. And then sweet little moments. The kids looking over there and seeing the kid asleep on the pool table in the evening. What it really taught me was that I had to adapt each story to the content. So when we started doing some stories here at Geographic several years ago on world food supply, I really needed to go someplace else. The first one that we did, uh, that I did with uh, Dennis Dimmick, 
was on soil. And so what I really had to do was I had to make soil interesting to folks who live in urban areas like you do, you know, and, and really show them that there was beauty and drama beneath their feet. So there were images like the previous one, this kind of thing up in the Palouse, uh, huge mega agriculture, the kind of soil erosion that you see in the Lush Plateau of China. But you know what really worked in that story? Is when we made the connection between the soil and the people, the farmers. So I did soil pits all around the world, up there in Kansas, there in Iowa, in the Palouse of Washington, in Brazil, in Syria, <coughs> Another one in Syria, this guy says we live by the will of Allah. They're trying to grow barley on that rocky soil, you know. On to China and the Lush Plateau, and finally, this woman trying to feed her family on that kind of soil in Africa. That one thing really made the connection, and that was the one of the things in that story that really worked. The other thing that worked was to show people what was going on beneath the soil. And we did it this way. We took a 14-foot long plant, and we photographed it in sections. So we're now about two feet above the surface, one foot above the surface, down to the surface of the, uh, of the soil about right here, and then down into the root ball underneath it. A foot, two feet down, three feet down into the soil, four feet down, about five feet here, six feet, it's still going on, seven feet down, eight feet down, and nine feet below the surface. That kind of thing really changed people's mind, that there was something going on there. You know, the power of the images found in the right way to do it. Of course, when you see this thing going on in the Shanxi province of China, you see what they have to do to try and bring their soil back. The second part of that was heirlooms, this story about saving the seeds that we need for our agriculture. So of course, I went up to the Svalbard Global Seed Vault in the Arctic, but I also went to seed savers to see all those myriad varieties of vegetables and whatnot that they, that they saved there. And I was happy as hell that they were having their annual tomato tasting, 47 varieties laid out there. When you're a photographer and you find an event like that, you hoop and holler, I tell you, you do. But I, what I really wanted was that relationship. So these pictures needed to have close relationship. Here's the guys at the Royal Welk Show, you know, and they looked just like they're, they're buddies, the cows are buddies, they're all buddies, you know? That's what I wanted, this 10,000 year relationship that you can kind of see in this guy holding the Sheko calf in Ethiopia. Or the kind of relationship they have up in the Andes where they grow 1,300 varieties of potatoes. They grew 400 varieties of potatoes in that field incredible amount of, of growth. What does that have to do with us today and why we should save these things? Well, the fact that they had, that the Irish depended on two varieties of potatoes was why the potato blight killed a million Irish people in 1847. And it's why we're worried as hell about this. A, a, a wheat rust blight that came out of Ethiopia in 1999 and is spreading around the world today and there's a great race going on to save wheat. That's kind of important stuff, you know, for mankind. So I loved being there with these guys singing as they harvested out in Ethiopia, of going to the markets to see these women selling teff, a grain which even I, coming from a farm in Kansas, had never really heard of, and particularly to be allowed into their kitchen as she was making injera there in the evening. All these kind of things, different kind of pictures for different kinds of stories. This story on the Flint Hills of Kansas really needed drama. It needed grace, beauty, and it, and it needed a way of elevating this place in the eyes of people who knew nothing about it and in the eyes of people who drove by it every day. These kind of places out there, I talked with people in Kansas who would say, you know, I never knew it was something. Nobody ever said it was something. It's my job as a photographer to put it up on the wall and say, hey, look at this, it's something, you know? And so I really wanted to go, but I hadn't, it had to have drama. So going out with the, uh, the hoys out there, burning off the prairie in the spring, where it makes those beautiful patterns of fire, this part of the natural ecosystem of, of uh, allowing the grass to come back, flying over four or five weeks later when it's turned lush and green like Ireland. This is Kansas into the meadows in the summer when the flowers are out, chasing the uh, fireflies out there in the evening, an hour after sunset, you know, over the wild alfalfa. 
They're all, they, by the way, these, this, is, this is sex on the planes, you know. This is, uh, <laughs> the guys are all up in the air flashing, saying, hubba hubba baby. And the, and the females are all down in the grass playing, here I am, here I am. That's pretty, uh, it's kind of like cruising Maine, you know. All those kinds of things. I knew that the pictures had to have those kind of elements. It really had to have a flow. It had to have drama. It had to have graphics. And it had to give us a sense of where we were. And so this is why I really worked this picture showing the wonderful dark skies that are out there on the prairie. I lit the tree up with a flashlight in the middle of the night. Southern Milky Way over there. Wonderful thing to do. That led me on to another story, the death of night. Because I had been an armchair astronomer all my life, and I knew that there was this issue of this incredible amount of light that we're pumping up in the sky. The figure is 80% of the world's population will never see the Milky Way again. I've shown some of these pictures in Saudi Arabia about two months ago, and somebody looking at those pictures leaned over to their friend and said, what is that up there? They were looking at the Milky Way. Now that's, just, that's like putting up a billboard in front of the Grand Canyon so that only 20% of the people can ever see it again. You know, that was what was going on. These pictures needed to have, have grandeur. They needed to, first of all, say that this night sky is something we need to save. And then it had to speak to what we are doing and why. Not by any particular malice, but, but by everyday action. So this was up over Chicago at about mm, 10,000 feet. Looking down on Central Park in New York from the Helmsley uh, uh, Hotel. Or seeing the way that the St. Louis Arch is lit up at night. All of that. That you could go out in the Bonneville Salt Flats and 110 miles away you can see the, the glow of Salt Lake City. Or how it's affecting astronomy here up on Mount Wilson Observatory with Los Angeles down below. Or how it is that birds fly into buildings that are lit up at night and kill themselves. And so I found up in, in uh, Toronto a place where they had all these birds in the freezer that they collected and they spread them all out. School group came in, teacher says, who can show me the cardinal? The kids point at it and bam, there's the picture. But most of all, I really enjoyed this. Going out on Juno Beach with a turtle who had come back to lay her eggs and she had never been there before. Thankfully, you know, she found her place uh, she wasn't distracted by the lights. Who knows what will happen to her babies. But as she was crawling back in there, she, they banded her, and they gave me the honor of naming her, and I named her after my wife, Kathy, who was not particularly impressed about having a girl named after her. I don't, get a, I don't know why, you know. But I got an email. I got an email uh, about six weeks ago. Kathy had come back and laid eggs again. And now her story has become part of our story, and that is the way that they, they work. And so thank you very much for letting me share these with you.